of our time. The great music that we were just playing is from Simon's band and from their aptly named album, The Band Who Must Not Be Named. <laughs> Simon is the founder and bassist of The Slants, an all Asian American dance rock band. The band consciously chose that name to reclaim the power in a racial slur against Asians and Asian Americans. In fact, Simon had himself been bullied with such taunts as a child growing up on the West Coast. But he learned early on to fight back with words, which bore great power. But when Simon tried to federally register the trademark in his band's name, the government denied his request under a decades-old provision of the federal trademark statute, which prohibited trademarks and words that are, quote, disparaging to racial and ethnic groups. Simon challenged this denial. First, on the ground that his band was using the term to empower, not disparage. He further pointed out that the law was more often than not used to suppress minority groups' speech, and had seldom, in fact, been used to stop truly disparaging trademarks. The Washington football team, for example, had successfully registered several trademarks in its name. In contrast, it was the Slants and groups like Dykes on Bikes, a pro-LGBTQ group, which were denied trademarks in their names. So for Simon, the issue was one of the fundamental right to self-identity and the danger of racial bias in government enforcement of speech regulations. His commitment to these issues led him to embark on an epic eight-year journey from the US PTO to the highest court in the land and around the country and the world, frankly, uh, to uh, talk about his experiences. Um, despite oppressive legal bills, Routinely feeling degraded by the legal system and the overwhelming burdens of juggling a rock band, several day jobs, relationships, and mounds of legal papers, he stuck with his case, demonstrating an inspiring commitment to having his voice as an Asian American activist heard by our legal system. Along the way, Simon, as he tells it, unwittingly enrolled in a, quote, crash course in intellectual property law that would last longer than my undergraduate and graduate studies combined, unquote. Finally, in 2017, in a landmark free speech decision, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled unanimously in Simon's favor. A musician, entrepreneur, and highly sought after speaker at events from TEDx, Comic Con, South by Southwest, and hundreds of events across North America, Europe, and Asia, our polymath guest has now added author to his list of accomplishments. And I just completed his new book, Slanted, How an Asian American Troublemaker Took on the Supreme Court and Commend It to Every Law Student and Attorney. In it, uh, as would be befitting of a First Amendment icon, Simon is brutally honest about his firsthand experience in an American legal system that's bureaucratic, hierarchical, dispiriting, racist, and degrading. We're privileged to hear today from Simon about his legal journey. Um, uh, and uh, he has kindly, I'm going to invite him to say a few introductory comments. But again, um, I think it's so befitting of Simon and his commitment to speech that he wants to uh, really reserve most of our hour together uh, for Q&A and, and to hear from all of us. Um, so we're going to have a chance to sit down with him now till about 1 o'clock uh, for Q&A about free speech intellectual property, racial identity, and the law. Welcome, Simon Tam. Thank you very much for, for having me here. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting that uh, we were having this conversation beforehand, because we know, we've known each other for a very long time. Um, from back when Professor Center was at uh, UC Davis School of Law, and um, and I think I was trying to kind of get my story heard. I, I think over the years, that was something I, that was really, really important to me to say, like, this is what it's like to work for the client. This is what it's like, when, even, if, even if we are a pro bono client, 
um, how it feels. And uh, nowadays, I, I've actually, I, I continue to share that story because I think it's important for, for those studying the law to, to hear that. But I also spend a lot of time like writing and, and speaking about things like um, you know, our civil liberties and, and civil rights in general as well. So I, I don't consider myself like a, a law scholar by any means. <laughs> um, but I, I've accidentally done things like publish law review articles, and apparently that's very hard to do. It was the Buffalo the Law School asked me to do it. So I was like, oh, I can, I can write about this. Um, but I, I do consider myself a, an artist and activist, like first and foremost. I mean, that, that, that I'm very, very passionate about fighting for the most marginalized members of our society and, and trying to use art and uh, unconventional approaches and, and addressing those particular needs as well. So that, that's a lot of like my work and um, and, and why why I'm here, why, why, why I wrote the book, and why, why I kind of share that story. Um, well, as Simon mentioned, uh, I met him many years ago when he was just kind of um, uh, going around to different universities talking about how he got mixed up in this legal case that would go on to consume so many years of his life. So I thought maybe you could start off by telling us, how does a nice rock star like you find his way in the US Supreme Court? Uh, what um, were the facts on the ground that led you into that case? But really, what was motivating you? What, what was in it for you that, that kept you uh, in that um, uh, process for so long? So the, the whole journey began uh, when I was actually already having like a, a thriving music career. Um, NPR had just done their first story on us on All Things Considered. They, they were speaking of this Asian American band that was turning stereotypes upside down all while building a geek army. And they called it a geek army because we were playing anime and video game conventions. Now I'm doing like law school luncheons, <laughs> different kind of geek army. Oh. <laughs> And, and like it was, I, I just left my job and, and like that was what I was doing. But everything started falling apart um, as it does when I became friends with an attorney. So, uh, my, my good friend Spencer Trowbridge, who's an IT attorney, sees all this momentum. He says, have you ever thought about applying to register your trademark? And of course, I was like, this sounds really expensive. I would like to just embark on this whole new career. But he assures me, Oh, it's only a few hundred bucks, and then like six months, you don't even be thinking about this anymore. Of course, it turned out a little different than that. Um, and you know, this is in late 2009 as we were preparing everything. And when 2010 rolled around, he calls me up and he says, "Hey, we have a problem with your application." I'm like, "Well, what is it?" And he says, "Well, the trademark office says the name of your band is disparaging to persons of Asian descent." So I was like, wait, does disparaging mean what I think it means? Are they saying we're racist to Asian people? <laughs> and he says, yeah. And I'm like, do they know we're of Asian descent? <laughs> and he's like, I think that's kind of obvious. And I'm like, I didn't even know there was law against this. There's all kinds of offensive stuff out there. What does it actually say? And of course, that's when I'm introduced to Section 2A of the Lanham Act, uh, which says you can't register trademarks that are considered scandalous and or disparaging. Um, <laughs> But he also tells me there's a second part to this law, like uh, the way it's enforced. So in order for the government to deny you the registration, they have to find what's called a substantial composite of the reference groups. In this case, a whole lot of Asian Americans uh, need to be offended or discouraged by the name for them to deny this to you. And, and I was like, well, we just spent the last few years working with community organizations across this country. Most of our fans are Asian American. Um, like, it's undeniable that we're active in the community. Every single Asian American radio show, TV show, magazine, newspaper, and podcast in the country is lauding our work and, our anti in particular, our anti-racism work. And so I was, like, really thrown off by it. And, I, and of course, I was like, so who did they find who was offended by our name? And that's when he said, <coughs> no one. He said, well, they, they didn't find a single person, but they did quote UrbanDictionary.com. <laughs> and, uh, and so with this entry on this Wiki Joke website, that's what was used to, to basically say, you, you're not getting this registration. And of course, I was a bit indignant and a little frustrated um, that, that that would happen. So we, we decided to appeal <coughs> using um, like the traditional method of appealing such a decision. And, and, you know, I, and I really encourage each of you to think about this. Like, how would you prove that you're not 
offensive to yourself? Like, what kind of evidence would you bring to the table? And, um, you know, over the next 18 months, we, we went to extraordinary lengths to, to, to do this. So I'd love you to share with them um, what you did do, because you, from the get-go, really went above and beyond. Um, and uh, you took that denied stamp and, and just ran with it in the other direction to, to, to overturn that. So could you share with um, uh, uh, the folks here today uh, what it, your attorney said you had to do, what the implications or costs of those things would have been, and, and what you ended up doing? Sure. So originally, um, Spencer's like, if we get you shown how your community is supporting you, like that should be good enough. So we got a couple of executive directors of uh, several Asian American social justice organizations to write uh, legal declarations in our support. We got um, about a dozen Asian American newspapers. We demonstrated how we were kind of how the mark was essentially being used in the marketplace, and and, and showed like it was all positive coverage, and it was all tied to Asian American communities. Um, and we sent all this in, it was probably about 50, 60 pages, and the government said, that's not good enough. Um, that's not good enough because this entry in UrbanDictionary.com says so. And so, so it's the Urban Dictionary entry versus, at this point, 50, 60 pages of testimony. Correct. Okay. And so Spencer calls up the, the attorney, uh, the examining attorney, and says, what's your problem? Like, how come, like, how come you're not, like, it's obvious that the band is, is our other community. The examining attorney says, to be honest with you, it's, it's coming from above. Um, but if you if you want to overcome this, you're going to have to get a dictionary expert. You're probably going to have to get a national survey. You're probably going to have to get uh, additional legal declarations. And so it kind of provides us with this to-do list uh, and a six-month deadline to get it all done. And that, that was the first time when I was like, I, I'm done. I, I don't need to do this. This is you know, a survey, that's like a couple hundred thousand dollars on top of all the legal fees. But um, what actually changed my mind and, and actually changed our, my thinking around it a lot was Spencer had a, a mentor and this renowned legal scholar named Keith Aoki is a did wonderful work around IP law, civil rights. And Keith is why I went to law school, and, well, or why I became a law professor. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 so. and Keith was just extraordinarily generous in, in, in talking about this, and and he says, no, you got to tell Simon it's a lot bigger than you ban. And he told Spencer, he's like, you need to do this for free. That, like, you need to help him out, because this is, there's, there's a lot more to it. Um, and and actually, he, he actually wrote like a couple paragraphs in, in our brief, but sadly was unable to work on it more because he had some of the disease, and so wasn't able to like dedicate more time. But um, when 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 Spencer's like telling me how big of a deal it was and how he's going to work for Bono, I said, okay, I'll, I'll do whatever it takes. And so Spencer tasked me with getting the survey and the dictionary experts and all that, and that's when I started combing through every other two A rejection that was out there. Uh, including one of the more, more high-profile ones, which is Dykes on Bikes. They got a dictionary expert uh, who is a, also a, a linguistic scholar. He is the president of the American Dialect Society. I wrote him a letter. He agreed to take the case on pro bono. And then I found two professors that specialize in politics and uh, racial identity, and they agreed to do the survey. Um, on top of that, we got every event organizer, because Asian Americans use slant this way all the time. Slant the Kings Comedy Tour, Slant TV, Slant Film Festival, on and on. So we got every one of those people to write in letters saying, we've been doing this 20, 30 years without a single complaint. And we put together uh, what a lot of people consider the biggest appeal on a two-way rejection in history with surveys, dictionary experts, more legal declarations. Every single Asian American newspaper in the country at that point weighed in. We think incarceration camp survivors. I mean, it was a huge huge appeal and i think i read in the book that you guys made the decision to actually drop the physical box yeah, to ship of, like to ship this like huge file yeah because they and i was actually at the time worried about the cost of scanning the pages at kinko's because uh, <laughs> you know that's how i was like just really barely make, making it meet at the time but spencer was like no we want to make that examining attorney hand scan every one of these pages so you can <laughs> literally feel the weight of your community and we send all this in, and two weeks later, they gave us another rejection. So it was like, no matter how much we brought to the table, it was clear that it was not going to be enough. 
and this time they had a little more than just Urban Dictionary. What would they? What, what did they have in addition? So they, this time they also quoted from uh, AsianJokes.com. They had a dictionary, but it wasn't an American dictionary. It was a British dictionary from 1938 of slang words, saying that it was offensive in that context. They used something called the Racial Slur Database, and uh, and slant was listed in there among very other common words like apple and banana and cab. Um, so like. You know, they, they, they went to greater lengths. And then on top of that, they also took the language of um, several advocacy organizations, like the Japanese American Citizens Alliance, and twisted them to make it sound as if they were against us. They weren't against us. They were against people using racist language. But, uh, and the Japanese American Citizens Alliance actually were some of the folks that filed in our support. Mm -hmm. um, and on top of that, they found an old MySpace.com blog that supposedly claimed one of our concerts was canceled due to controversy over our name. But we actually had the, the steering committee of that event because the Asian American Youth Leadership Conference said, no, it wasn't about the name. In fact, I was their keynote speaker the following year and the band performed in three subsequent years and they gave me an award. So they're like, obviously this committee doesn't have a problem with the band, but they, they ran with this blog uh, that, you know, they convey all the facts. So as you're involved now in this increasingly Orwellian peck and forth with the USPTO and the examining officer, it sounds like you were becoming aware of other groups who either had similar experiences to you, like Dykes, with, uh, Dykes on Bikes, or um, were, at, at what point um, uh, did you encounter groups like the um, Native American activists who were contesting uh, the um, using the same provision of the uh, trademark statute to contest uh, uh, disparaging terms such as the name of the Washington football team. So that didn't happen until like five years into this. Okay. Yeah. One, once we got where um, we had to, sh we basically shifted arguments because I transitioned from Spencer being an attorney to becoming a different attorney. Spencer was getting burnt out at law. And he's like, law is too hard. I'm not going to renew my license. He's like, I'm taking this in You drove him out of the law? <laughs> I thought it was my fault. But he's actually a lawyer today. Okay. Uh, and now he's been made partner. So he's, he's doing okay. But but like for a while, he's like, I, I can't handle this. And so I looked online, and there was a guy who blogged about our case. I reached out to him. He agreed to take it up to the But he says, as long as you fight like this, you're not going to win. So he... Um, thinks we should abandon our application and reapply, which we do. Um, we get the exact same exam returning copies and cases of rejection, uh, which we are like, hey, you just broke your own rules. Because the trademark examiner's procedures manual says you're supposed to do a fresh search every time. And so we're kind of appealing using, using the procedural and evidentiary arguments. But as we come up to our hearing at the Federal Circuit, after we get out of the whole bureaucracy of the trademark office, we're, we're going to D.C. My attorney, Ron, is completely offline, not answering his emails, not answering his phone. And I'm like, what's going on? Turns out he had a medical emergency, so he was totally out of the picture. And so the junior associate, Joel McMall, steps in. Uh, and he has to write the brief, although, if we're to be honest, he was probably doing all the work anyway. Like, how's the pro bono guy? Um, and Joel was like, you know, as a trademark attorney, you don't get to write a lot of constitutional arguments. So he decides to throw some in for practice, uh, a meager two-page argument um, saying that they violated my due process rights because they were using my ethnic identity against me, um, and also a three-page argument on, like, maybe this might uh, violate my First Amendment rights. The court seized on that, said, we don't care about any of your arguments. We just got rid of the constitutional one. Um, you know, we, we lost. Mm -hmm. Then they reversed that decision five days later with the sua sponte order to vacate. Had us come back and, and argued the thing en banc. And when that happened, it made um, pretty substantial legal news. Uh, you know, they, they called it a, a legal unicorn, that the fact that the court would just invite us in en banc and do all this stuff. And that's when I became on the radar of other people with different interests and started um, speaking with uh, the legal counsel and, and activists in the Native American community who were working on a different case, which is the Black Horse Youth Pro Football case that was trying to sue to cancel the registrations of the Washington football team. And so that's when we started like talking about it. Uh, 
and, and very open. Right? Sure, sure. So as a litigant who for so many years was pursuing kind of justice in your, in the context of your specific case, and now to become aware of the broader implications of um, the First Amendment validity of this provision and the um, uh, multiple other constituents, other social activists around that, how did that play into your own then continued approach in the case and, um, and, and how did it change, if anything, the way you were approaching the case? Well, um, I would say it certainly gave me pause. As a longtime like supporter of the Change the Name and, uh, campaign, I was like, "Wait a second! I don't want to accidentally make Dan Snyder win. That guy sucks. <laughs> like, <laughs> like he's a jerk. I don't like. This is not what I was set out to do." Um, but so I started kind of having these deep conversations with a number of social justice mentors. Um, I mean, I met with over. 40 different leaders in, in just in the Portland area, including numerous confederated tribal leaders. I spoke with a number of uh, legal scholars about like what was happening. And they, they were kind of encouraging me to continue on. They said, well, justice isn't just about punishing folks who abuse rights. Justice, if, if you want to talk about like, equity, is about providing those fewest options, more options in our society. And they saw what was happening with the law. Um, so, you know, I talk about like there's disparate impact of this law because if, if you think about it, who are the kinds of people that reappropriate language? I mean, women, people of color, members of the LGBTQ community. But it turns out that can actually make you prime targets under a law like Section 2A because you have government officials who aren't considering uh, your intention. They're just like saying like, whoa, you're way too close to this term. You're, that, that's inappropriate. So that, that was the reason why when we asked the trademark office, hold on a second, if, if, if slant is this inherent racial slur they claim it is, how come you gave it to everyone else? There have been over 800 other applications for slant. All of them were cool, but when it came to the slant, it was not okay. Like, why is that? And that's when the government said I was too Asian to use the mark. Said you can't disassociate the Asian identity of the person from the mark, and so there's always going to be association with disparagement. Uh, in other words, anyone can register the slants as long as they're not Asian. Turns out that was the case across the board for a number of other terms. Like Dykes on Bikes, they struggled with registering their name and later their logo. Yet other companies got to register it just fine. But when it was a pro lesbian motorcycle club, they're like, the association is too great. Uh, same thing with you know, in Asian American communities, the most devastating term is probably the term chink, a term that the government gave out gave out eight other times to non-Asians. The only person ever rejected in our QA was when a, an activist named Randall Lou stepped up to create t-shirts that said Chink Proud in Atlanta, Georgia. And the government's like, nope, that's too Asian. And so these other community leaders are seeing how that was playing out. And they're like, we need to give people an equal playing field. We need our communities to determine what's appropriate for ourselves, not necessarily this one examining attorney or individual examining attorneys. So that's why they kind of encouraged me to keep going. Um, and I even spoke with some of the members of the legal counsel uh, who worked with Susan Harjo. That was the case before it became Black Horse, which uh, lost on the technicality. And they were saying, like, there's a good chance that even if the uh, Black Horse case moves forward, they're probably going to lose the Supreme Court due to the constitutional arguments around this. Uh, they have a really uphill battle. And they're like, we'd rather have you win than Dan Snyder win, because if he wins, he's going to parade this around the community, and it's going to be even more devastating and degrading and, and more of a setback for our work. So I was basically encouraged to publicly move forward, and they publicly denounced my campaign, but were privately supporting me. And it was just one of those, like, you play the left flank, I'll play the right flank in order to achieve this great idea of justice. Hmm, wow. Um, well, I have my cultural appropriation students in here today. And I just, you're, I mean, we just finished reading your book over the weekend. Um, there's so many layers of, uh, you know, stories around cultural appropriation and the complexities of, of um, cultural appropriation in your um, journey. So you start out by uh, naming your band, you know, reappropriating a slur to take back the power of it, uh, in it, um, uh, and and 
it seems like what was motivating you throughout the journey too was this idea of getting your unique, your distinct voice heard um, uh, by these legal examiners, by the legal system. Um, at what points in the journey did you feel like you actually were heard? And uh, and I know for the end you felt that you were um, that your case was hijacked in your words uh, by First Amendment maximalists, by the team who must not be named. Um, and, uh, and so, so if you could talk to us a little bit about, you know, ways in which you were able to get your voice heard to, to reclaim power um, and, and your experience of, of being appropriated by others, in fact, others that you disagree with. So, you know, it's interesting because as like an artist and an activist, <laughs> as somebody who like started this band with a certain set of principles, <laughs> a lot of the things I was fighting for did not make good legal arguments. It couldn't be captured in a legal brief or an oral argument to, to, in a courtroom. And that was the most frustrating thing in the world to me. Because I would say the arguments that I thought that, that had <coughs> the most merit and had the most, that represented who I was the most, was the fact that our band is not disparaging, and the fact that we were doing um, a lot of anti-racism work. And oftentimes, we would do this work on behalf of the US government, which was like very perplexing to me. Because like whenever the government needed outreach to Asian Americans and youth in particular, they called us. The Obama administration. The Obama you guys. Yeah. A couple months before we oral arguments at the Supreme Court, we, we helped lead a campaign with George Takei and Jeremy Lin to create a bullying program to address uh, the, the, you know, the problems that Asian American students are facing, or uh, when the Department of Defense was getting horrible press because it turns out Asian American soldiers are being hazed to death, well, they called us. You know, in 2011, 2012, we spent our holidays with troops serving overseas to build this kind of cultural approach. So I was like, how come whenever we're, you need us, you call us up, but when when we when you don't need us, you can immediately call us the racist band. It, it, it was like, that was very, very frustrating. And so for me, I, I, I was like, well, we got to do some stuff, even if it's symbolic in nature, to hopefully make our voice heard. So a lot of the approach I took was outside of the courtroom. Uh, for example, I was like, you know, if some Asian people, or if the Supreme Court is hearing arguments about what's offensive to Asian people, I thought it's really important for some Asian people. Like, they, my attorneys were telling me we weren't even guaranteed seats in the room. And I was like, no, I'm not accepting that answer. Like, we are going to be there no matter what. Um, we, we, and, and so we made sure we were in the room. Uh, we also, you know, we released this album, The Band Who Must Not Be Named. We dedicated it to the U.S. government, filled it with songs about <laughs> fighting back and having our identity. Because we were like, even if we can't say it in the court ourselves, we have things to say, and we think they're important. Um, and so I was like, really, really, like, it became really important to me to like, take control of that narrative. And, and that's also why after oral arguments at the Supreme Court, uh, but between that time period and their decision, which ultimately was on, on June 19, um, I was like, I'm going to do something unconventional. I'm going to just tour across this country and speak to as many bar associations, <coughs> law schools, and legal groups as possible, hoping that our story would trickle up to the clerks at the Supreme Court. And somehow it all worked, but because I was like, I'm not gonna let someone else tell my story. Like, I'm not gonna let like Dan Snyder claim this victory. I'm not gonna like just try as they might. Like, it was really, really important to me. Like, but like, and your book is really being able to tell your side of the story. And, and yeah, congratulations. It's very powerful. But thank you. But it, it's so frustrating because like you know, history is written by the victors. Uh, and, and like as I was going through this battle, I was like, I don't know what's going to happen, but I don't want like for the rest of my life to be known as either the band who's racist towards Asian Americans, despite being Asian American, uh, or the guy who who you know secured a victory for Dan, Dan Snyder. Either one of those seemed like terrible options, and so I was like, I'm going to cut my own path, a new path, and, and, and say like it's okay to hold multiple things, even if they're complex. And, and, and to like do my best in reaching out to community groups that are affected, as well as those who might have the ability to convey that message to those in power. Well, I was really struck by you know the constant feeling that you weren't being heard by our legal system. And he, he talks about a fantasy 
uh, that he has that during the Supreme Court oral argument, the Chief Justice will say, what do you think about this, Simon Tan? And, and he says, I would have said everything that I wish my attorneys would have had the courage to express. And I think what you're sharing with us today is the failure of the legal system to, one, um, allow for these diverse voices, but also to even provide the language um, uh, and the, the sets of arguments that you were feeling were really at stake. Um, I want to open this up now to the group uh, to um, see if people have questions uh, for Simon or comments that they'd like to share. Yes. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, so you mentioned at the outset that you view yourself as an artist and an activist, uh, first and foremost, um, yet with the way like our society is set up, uh, we sort of view artistic expression as property and you know, you're expected to license your songs as copyrights, you're expected to register your band name as a trademark. Um, so has this experience uh, given you, I know we've focused on sort of uh, free expression and free speech so far, but has this experience given you misgivings about uh, artistic expression as property in general, or do you sort of see that as, uh, see your experience as sort of like an absurd result? Uh, system that generally makes sense. I, I mean, I don't, I don't think we need to like smash the system of like, you know, how copyright and, and, and trademark law work. I think we do need to refine it. I think uh, that a lot of the ways that we think about those laws um, don't do the artist justice. I mean, we talk about uh, everything from newer forms of expression, like when, uh, like when rap music uses sampling. It's like we need to have room for. That's a, that's a new kind of creative idea. I mean, fashion photographers, uh, painters, uh, authors, they, they borrow all the time. Uh, like, why is this being singled out as different? Uh, we need to have, I think, like laws that actually are more robust in terms of like, addressing how do you deal with these things when you have like rampant like, streaming and piracy. Like, I, I, I think what too often what happens is that you have people making decisions about or creating laws, but who don't have any experience of what it's like. And oftentimes, the people, like the artists, we rely on representatives. So in our case, it would be ASCAP, EMI, CSAC, the kind of like the big um, performer artistic rights organizations. But oftentimes, they they have their own hierarchy of those with, who are a, a bit more privileged who don't understand how difficult it is to to survive as an independent artist. Because not only are you creating art, you also are creating business, and you're creating products. Um, so I, I hope that people who are going into it, just like whether it's you know laws around creative expression or laws around how we enforce like laws and in, in, in neighborhoods, I, I think we need to have more of a like an oversight by people more directly impacted by the laws. Too too often we just. We're just shuffled under, like it, as if uh, our voices count, like we don't know enough, or, or whatever it might be. I mean, in, in my case, I was like, I'm in fighting for freedom of speech in the nation's highest court, and in that room, I am not allowed to say a thing. Like, that's there's a deep sense of irony there. there like, <laughs> if I spoke out, I would probably get kicked out of the room. <laughs> like, you know, like I couldn't even sit near my attorneys. Uh, they, and in fact. Um, if for, folk, for folks who are familiar with the layout of the room, like beyond the, the tables where the attorneys are arguing from, there's like chairs reserved for members of the court, the attorneys that you know pay extra, they get the good seats, they can do fancy things. Then there's like rows and rows of pews. When I was seated, uh, we were led to the second row of those pews. And, and it's funny because like everyone in the room saw like four Asian dudes up front in suits. <laughs> so of course they're assuming that it's the band, you can hear a commotion, and someone's like, hey, uh, does it, don't they get to sit in the front row of this section? At least the front row. Um, and the court martial, upon conferring of the Solicitor General, comes back to me and says, I'm sorry, but we're saving the seat in case someone important shows up today. <laughs> like, in the eyes of the court, I am not important. I am visible, I am insignificant. Because they have much bigger and more money to talk about, uh, and, and that's what I feel like sometimes laws around, like trying to address these very very complex topics, treat the people who are actually creating that content are, are like. Masha, 
Um, kind of piggybacking on that exact point, um, I, I've heard, you know, lawyers say before, you know, we're looking for the perfect plaintiff and you who seems really articulate and, and you're young and you've got energy and um, you genuinely believe in the issues, you seem like the perfect plaintiff in, in many ways. And you mentioned before that sometimes you were, you know, working all these jobs or you kind of just got deflated by the issues and it wasn't, you kind of were losing hope of it. Did you find that, um, you know, was it your own belief sometimes that led you forward? Did you did you find like attorneys kind of being like egging you on, being like, "This is really important. Like, please don't get out of the race." And how did you kind of deal with that tension between your own fundamental beliefs, but kind of need to get on with your life, in just like a practical sense, with this this potential to make the impact that you have? So uh, for most of the years uh, that I was fighting, I was. I felt like, uh, and, and, and this is not to disparage my attorneys, I think they're extremely generous for, for doing pro bono work for so long, but I felt like every time I emailed them, I was a nuisance. I was the pro bono client. I was just like doing, dealing with a simple matter of trademark registration, which meant everything to me. But to them, it was like the work they did on the side after they got the real work done, the billable hours and everything else. I didn't become important in their eyes, or at least in the eyes of their law firm, who ultimately were like, why are you spending all this time on this pro bono client? It didn't become important until we got to the federal circuit. And then all of a sudden, the law firm's like, oh, we're so proud to represent this guy. Um, so it's kind of funny how, kind of how it plays out. But like, as far as like, uh, the attorneys, they, they weren't really egging me on, so to speak. Uh, I had those early conversations with my, my first attorney, Spencer, uh, who, who encouraged me to fight for, for what I felt was right, to fight for my principles. Um, the relationship I had with the, the new law firm later on was very, very different. I hardly spoke to them. I didn't even meet them in person until we were going to our unblocked hearing in DC. So that was five years in. Um, so it, it just had a very different type of relationship. But for, for me, I was like, if, if, what, if you're representing me, I need to like sign off on these arguments. Like I need to like at least like have a conversation with you why you're writing what you're writing. Um, and, and I tried a lot of times to say like, hey, we should say this. And sometimes they would say like, for my benefit, they would remove those arguments. Um, but, but it was like, I, I still wanted to be active. And I think, I don't know if I was the, the perfect client because I was like a very unusually active client. And that could be very annoying to, to people who <laughs> might think they know the law better. Um, but I, like, I did a lot of things that was that I wasn't asked to do. I read every single law review article related to Section 2A. I, I, I read, like, I studied the law like nobody's business because I want to know it in and out because I want to, am I doing the right thing? Am I inadvertently causing harm to someone? You know, like, those were all things that were very, very important to me, uh, which also sometimes made me annoying because I'd be like, hey, have you read this part paper from Dean Carpenter? <laughs> you know, like, I, I would, and I would send them things and I would be like, hey, why, why aren't we getting a brief from this person? Um, but at the end of the day, I think like we have a cordial relationship. <laughs> it, it worked out, but I don't know if there is such thing as a perfect client because it's going to be diff different depending on the term. For a lot of firms, it's going to be the term, uh, the client that stays quiet, uh, that doesn't say anything. And for a long time, they asked me to not say things. They're like, we don't want you to impact the, the outcome of the case. And I was like, no, I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Like, you know, that's they even invited people who disagreed with you to file amicus on the other side to your attorney's annoyance. I mean, they were oh, they not happy that. about that. <laughs> but I was like, our community needs to be heard. And if there's disagreement, we're not a monolithic group. Their voices matter just as much as mine. Like, why am I fighting for freedom of expression if I need to shut everyone who disagrees with me up? And I was like, no, if you, if you have a problem with my case, please articulate it. Need to hear. Through um, the book, I was just going to add one thing on this. Um, you lament that Asian Americans are often used to divide, to you know, put a wedge uh, with, between um, different racial groups. Absolutely. And, um, and and could you maybe talk a little bit about how your battle did not end when you quote won, because then mm -hmm. you were faced with all of the um, aftermath uh, with the Washington Football Team, and the, and they. Uh, the activists that were challenging that trademark dropped their case. Had to, it, it was 
now moot because the provision on which they were fighting was now declared unconstitutional. Um, but I know you have, um, up to today, up to this present moment, continued to work on the implications and the aftermath of your case. Um, you did an event with, I think, Jacqueline Keeler two weeks ago. She's one of yeah. the co-founders of Not Your Mascot. Could you just talk a little bit about how, the, you know, your continuing work? Sure. So, um, you know, as, as part of that, like, impact on other communities, I, I wanted to work with the Native American community and continue to do so in eradicating offensive mascots because I don't believe that human beings should be used as mascots. And like that's that's something that shakes me to my core uh, because that is another example of someone not having the dignity of choosing their identity, of having their identity determined for the sort of course it, 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 I, I can identify with. Um, so I work with Jacqueline to do a number of events. In fact, um, my book release in, in Portland uh, was earlier this month, which happened to launch Native American History Month. So I invited her on to co-present, and we actually used the band's platform to talk about these issues. So during during the aftermath of our case, we had this huge surge of followers from Washington, D.C. because of the Washington football team. Like their fans were like, oh, you did it, yes. And I was like, that's great. Uh, now let me explain to you why it's wrong. <laughs> like what you know, like just because something is legal doesn't mean it's ethical. And so we would have some credibility with their fans and we'd say, Well let this is why we fought and let, let us explain how that is similar to the battle that other people fight. And we're able to sway a lot of their fans uh, to, to, to actually look at it in new light. And and so I think that's like really important is like sit to like continue to work with these communities. Um, you know, I, I understand that even in the Native American community, they're, like Asian Americans are not a monolithic group. Um, uh, Amanda Blackhorse, who's this astounding social worker, who's, you know, her, they, they put the names of the plaintiffs in alphabetical order. And because her name was Blackhorse, she ended up being first. But she had dealt with a barrage of death threats, sometimes other Native Americans saying, well, you shouldn't be doing this because that team is actually providing us with representation. Like, we don't like the name, but we can reappropriate it. And so, like, there is, there is, like, this continued disagreement even in that community as well. So, so we're trying to use this as a way to say, like, how can we seize identity? Why, why is it important? No matter what plays out in the court system or football teams or, or bands, how can we seize our own identity and, and use that conversation to talk about how marginalized groups can fight against white supremacy together instead of being divided over the scraps that were left. Um, so you mentioned earlier that at one point in the litigation, a lot of the arguments that you and your um, legal team were making were kind of co-opted by free speech maximalists. Um, what, what kind of arguments were they making, and how did that one make you feel as like, the plaintiff to have no control over how the conversation moved in that direction, and how did your legal team respond to that? Or did they just kind of let it happen? No, I, I mean, I, I think... Um, you know, I was working with IP attorneys, not constitutional attorneys. So we were still learning constitutional law. Like, we were kind of building the plane as we were flying in the middle of it. Uh, when we were going to DC, in particular, with the en banc hearing at the Federal Circuit, um, the court actually allotted the ACLU 10 minutes to argue between the two different sides, which is pretty extraordinary. And uh, we didn't, you know, we didn't invite them on as co counsel. My, my attorneys were worried because ACLU tends to be free speech maximal. My attorneys wanted to have some backup plans. Like we'll, while we were arguing the law was indeed unconstitutional, we were like, but even if it's not unconstitutional, the ban is not disparaging. ACLU wanted to just say, no, it's unconstitutional, eradicate this law, and that's it. And so my, my attorneys thought as a safeguard, it'd be better to not invite them on and just allow them to argue. Um, I would say during those arguments, um, Lee Rowland was the, the senior staff attorney at the time uh, when she was arguing for the court. It was like unbelievable to me because like they were asking all these questions and for the first time I saw the power of someone who really understood how to wield the First Amendment. And uh, I wrote about this because I was like, it was like watching the first time like when Neil realizes he's the one in the Matrix. <laughs> it's like, like, yeah, whatever, like he was flying by. And that's what it was like, like 12 judges all firing upon her. And she's just, no, like, let me explain, like, this is how it, it, this works. And this is what I mean to protect the freedom of expression. Um, when that happened, and when I started seeing those arguments, I started realizing, like, oh, okay, I, I, I'm 
much more in favor of free speech than I thought. Um, <laughs> you, you know, and in fact, when we were going to the Supreme Court, I was trying to urge my attorneys to consider co-counseling with a number of uh, attorneys and, and, and legal organizations, but they ended up not, not doing that. Um, and I was contacted by, like, I want to say 70 to 80 firms. Like, everybody wanted to, like, take the case and, and be the ones to argue before the Supreme Court. And, uh, including a number of, like, high-profile attorneys whom I deeply respect. But, but at the end of the day, I thought, well, these guys worked for free for five years. This is at least I can get to this. You know, like, if they win, hopefully it's good for their career. Because I, I couldn't pay them. So maybe this could be my way of demonstrating it. And then I also thought, I need to win on principle, not because I have the most eloquent practice attorney who knows all these justices. Um, you know, my, my attorneys had never been to the Federal Circuit before I was along. They had never been to the Supreme Court before I was there. Like, I caught them taking selfies. <laughs> <laughs> That's how fresh they were. But I was just like, I need to win on principle. I don't always recommend that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to say thank you for you know fighting for Asian American voice empowerment. And as you've mentioned, Asian American group as a whole is not monolithic. And now that you've gained this voice um, to speak for our community, and um, how do you plan on using it to advertise or let other people know about our diversity? And especially with um, words like slanted, where it's usually a word of discrimination instead of empowerment. And a lot of us still consider it a word of discrimination. How do you protect those people who feel hurt by your victory? So I, I think it's still important to lift up the voices of those impacted and, and those who, even, who disagree with ideas of reappropriation, um, but like allow there to be room for constructive debate in our community. So a lot of our work um, outside of like writing music and performing music is working with social justice advocacy organizations. In fact, I partner with over 140 social justice organizations across this country. We do everything from anti-bullying work to passing legislation that impacts um, uh, legislation that can, you know, deconstruct things like the model minority myth. Uh, we work with a number of schools. We just started a nonprofit organization ourselves to, to actually provide scholarship and mentoring to artists who want to take unconventional paths of their career and incorporate activism in. So, like, that's been a part of our band. I mean, we, I spent the last 12 years serving on. 11 different nonprofit organization boards all on fighting for social justice um, throughout the throughout the country so I, I would say well, we act, our band actually retired like last last Monday was our last show so uh, so I could spend more time focusing on the philanthropy and on the, on the activism side of things so uh, it's it's I think it's just inherently built in into who we are and and also for me I'm, I'm very passionate about this idea of reappropriation um, and so trying to educate people on what it's like to, to be able to control identity and how powerful it is to have tools like reappropriation, irony, satire, and wit. Because I, I do believe these are tools that we can, we can use to neuter hate, that we can use our tech to change hearts and minds, where sometimes legislation will fail to do so. Um, so that, that's a lot of my work now. Uh, the St. Louis University just published a paper on, on the power of reappropriation, including on the term slant. Uh, they, they used us as a case study in 2017 without my knowledge. They did a bunch of surveying around it, and um, they just released the findings of this report. And they, they find that uh, reappropriation can actually tame uncivil discourse, in particular around groups of sharp provision. So it's a really fascinating study around like, psychology and identity and, of course, politics as well. One last question, and then Please don't leave before having a chance to grab some swag on your way out. We've got the books and CDs and everything here. But Salira, last question. Um, do you think that the model minority myth like played a part in this decision? Do you believe that like the Supreme Court and people who are looking at this are like, oh, well, Asians are you know the friendly minority group, and how would, did that impact the litigation? Do you think that you know if you guys were a band member of the minority group, that it maybe has a more negative? Stereotypes around it. Uh, I, I don't think it really impacted uh, the legislation, I mean, like in terms of what happened in the courts. Um, I, I think it was it, it was interesting because the, the trademark office kept trying to push us as the outliers. We were the anti-racist band. We were the disparaging band. Um, so I, I I don't really think that, but but other people did perceive it that way. That like well, um, we were being 
each read it then some some other activists. But the reality is like when you looked at like how the law was being enforced and I looked at all the, the different folks who had been rejected under 2A, um, it was pretty consistent across the board. If you just happen to be a little too too Asian like in my case, or too queer like in the case of Thanks and Bikes, or too feminist like in uh, the Seattle Rock Band called Thunder Pussy, they, you know, we were all rejected for terms that were being registered every day by for-profit companies who were given the benefit of the doubt because they happen to be Caucasian or apparently Caucasian or apparently had wealth. Um, those were all things that I think like kind of demonstrated it was, it was much bigger than, than just that community or just this idea that, uh, I mean, certainly the government didn't think I was a part of the model minority. They called me a troublemaker. So, um, you know, that I, I, I do think it, it played a role in terms of the public and how they viewed the Excuse me, the case, but not necessarily in, in what went down. Well, thank you for making trouble, good trouble, <laughs> necessary trouble, as John Lewis would say. Um, and I hope you can all join me in thanking uh, Simon Tam for joining us. Here. <laughs> Please grab one of his books or CDs down here. Thank you. Thank you.